I teach a, a hybrid class, and I asked Johanna to come and talk to my class and to David Ewan's new media class and to all of you about, um, what are we calling it, transmedia writing? Hybrid forms writing in a networked world. The reason that I asked her to come is because about a year, Gina, when was your, what is Gina? Yeah. Gina, what was that panel that you did? A, was it a year ago? Well, it was, a, yeah, a few years ago. So I was introduced to Johanna a, a, about a year ago. Um, Gina did a, a panel about publishing and writers and the future of, of, for writers and publishing. And it was a very dark evening. I, I mean, it was a wonderful evening and it was informative and it was interesting, but it was, it, it was, it, it felt dark to me. It was, you know, it, it sounded like there wasn't much of a future for us, except that there was this one person on this panel and her face was really screwed up in consternation. Each time somebody would get up and talk about the, the bleak future for the writer uh, in publishing, her face would get sort of more perturbed. And then when it was her turn to talk, she said, listen, you guys, the world is wide open. There's so much happening. There's so much happening in new media. There's so much happening across media. And it was very exciting to hear her speak. So when I started this class, and, and um, this class in hybrid forms, and David and I talked about our, our various, uh, our syllabi, um, we decided that it would be really fun to have her come talk to all of you. Um, Joe Hanna is the deputy director at the Norman Lear Center here on campus. Uh, she, I, I have notes somewhere, but they, but they focus on on um, the the cross the crossing of entertainment and commerce and and information and how that is exploding everywhere. And um, Johanna is in particular interested in, in intellectual copyright um, and really really savvy about social media and new media. And so I asked her to come and give this talk tonight. And please help me welcome her. Yes. Very various examples of what people are doing in the new media space. 
uh, to sort of demonstrate different trajectories, different ideas, just to get the thoughts bubbling and roiling, and uh, then we'll have a conversation. But please, interrupt it at any point, really, that, that doesn't threaten me at all. Um, how many of you have heard the term transmedia? Okay, about half the people in the room. Um, there's a scholar now at the Ann Arbor School named Henry Jenkins, who we have stolen away from MIT. Pup, I can't believe they let us have him. And he's really the foremost sort of cultural critic and academic who talks about transmedia. And he has a very specific definition of it, which I can try out at some point. But generally, he's, he's talking about the future of storytelling as being uh, something that won't be confined to one frame or to one platform. That you write a novel and there's going to be this expectation that you're also going to do some sort of new media component with it. You write a poem, there's going to be some expectation that there's going to be a Twitter feed or a Facebook page or a website or an animation that's somehow associated with that. These are the kinds of expectations that people are building as we become more and more immersed in the new media world. And so Henry Jenkins talks about how transmedia is going to uh, affect the storytelling process across all disciplines. And I mention this because at the, at the end I'll give you some information about a conference that is actually hosted. It's a USC, UCLA thing. I think it's April 8th. I'll put the information out of it at the end of the talk. And I encourage you guys to go. I wish I could go and I'm not going to be in town. But it'll be a way to sort of continue this conversation. Um, I thought I'd start off with a crass piece of advertisement that I saw at TED. I was at the TED conference last week, and so I thought I'd include a few things that were mentioned at that conference. And one of them was this advertisement, which crystallized for me in a video what I see possible in a transmedia sort of universe. So uh, I'll run it now. <clears throat> There's a new outfit, I don't know how new they are, but this app is new, 
called Push Pop Press. And they have made the most amazing interactive book uh, platform that I've seen so far. It works on the iPad and it works on the iPhone. And their first book that they used for the demo was Al Gore's new book called Our Choice, which is about environmentalism and global warming. And the demo was absolutely amazing. You could, you could, you could manipulate with your hands everything in the book. You could read it just like an electronic book. You could flip through the pages and read it in a linear format. Or you could take the photos, you could grab them, you could make them larger, you could click a thing to hear what Al has to say about the photo, you could turn it into a video and watch the documentary that's about that photo. You can look at interactive charts, there's all these possibilities for exploring the tangents within the material in a way that was as tactile as I've ever seen. They basically merged together about an hour and 20 minutes of documentary footage with a book that he had written, and they had created all these amazing uh, interactive information graphics. And this isn't all that surprising. We know that all that technology exists, but it's like, hello, this is the future of the book. <laughs> Keep this in mind as you're writing a book that people are going to expect to be able to interact with it on a, a platform like the iPad. Um, I also wanted to uh, to showcase today at least one book trailer. This has been such an interesting sort of evolution of the publishing industry, having to do something like a film trailer for a book. And I wanted to choose one today that might sort of thematize what we're talking about, this notion of translating writing to new media platforms. And this just happens to be the theme of this trailer um, for, uh, let's say, the author. Uh, it won some award, an international award for best book journal, so that's one reason I found it. Let's take a look. Ways about the materiality of 
of our work, the materiality of books, and how it is that we can take advantage of that in order to exploit a visual and audio-based uh, medium. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Electric Literature site? Just a few people. I know David teaches it in his class. I, uh, it's a site that, that um, really publishes amazing short stories by, uh, by, uh, by very talented and established writers, and it tries to create a sort of online hub for, uh, for the storytelling experience. And, and one section of their site has some really interesting videos that are called uh, Single Sentence Animations. I think that's the, yeah, Single Sentence Animations. And what I like about them is that it's not that they're taking a story and turning it into a film, and it's not that they're translating a story into a script and then turning that into a film. Instead, they're sort of making a trailer for the short story. And they're just plucking out one sentence out of, out of the entire story, obviously, in order to create a sort of visual meme for you. And in this one, I thought it was especially interesting because they, they, they perform the visualization and then they tell you what the sentence is. And I think it's, a, it's just a new way to think about the relationship between writing and an audiovisual medium. about a conspiracy theory, it was about a woman who disappeared. 
here mysteriously. But on the website, and so it was a television drama, but on the website, you found out that there was this woman who was uh, making a big stink because she claimed the network had stole a story about her friend uh, and, and an investigation that she was actually pursuing to try to find her friend. She was arguing that the story was about her friend and they hadn't asked for permission. And so people believed it and they started following her blog and they started picketing in front of the television station and there were debates using the real personnel from the television station to debate with this woman who was an actress hired by them. And they had all these disclaimers that they were using throughout the whole thing uh, to let them know this is all a game, this is all just a piece of fiction. Um, but by the end of it, 4.5 million people in Sweden participated in the game. There were these huge protests, there were demonstrations, they were putting posters up all over town, there was a lot of gameplay involved, you had to collect clues and stuff. And 25% of the people, when they surveyed the users at the end, really thought that it wasn't a game. They thought <laughs> that all of these disclaimers were covering up the truth, right? <laughs> so that the power of this feeling of a conspiracy theory was the perfect sort of motor for this alternate reality game. Because we're really asking people to, dis to suspend disbelief in a very strange way. Um, and a conspiracy theory is a really way, great way to do that. So anyway, um, I would read more about, about this show. There's a lot of stuff online about it and some clips as well. Um, it was a really fascinating sort of example of how you can take a story and really and blast it out over lots of different media and really get people in the streets actually interacting with your story and believing it. Okay, the next one I wanted to do um, I wanted to do a mix of both very commercial things and very non-commercial things. This is totally non-commercial. How many of you know about Heavy Industries? Young H HM, and Heavy Industries? Oh, you do, you do. Um, I, they've been around for a while. They're sort of concrete poetry web artist types. But I wanted to include one piece by them because I think a lot of people feel that when you talk about writing in new media, it means translating everything into a highly produced film or some sort of animation or a game. And that's not necessarily the case. In this, really, they just take an audio sample, and I'll tell you what it is uh, at the end, and an idea. And they use typography to create this very powerful uh, sort of uh, piece of new media writing. So I'll, I'll play it now. It's called Dakota. And it's supposed to be based on a reading of Ezra Pound's Canto 
was one and two. I haven't quite figured out the connection where the candles in a long time, but now I'm very curious to look back at them. Um, so uh, the website for their stuff is yhchang.com if you want to take a look at, at more of their stuff. Um, this is probably my favorite. I, I haven't been to their site in a while now. But it sort of demonstrates what you can do with poetic language in a, in a visual format, and it doesn't necessarily mean teaming up with a photographer and an animator. Um, so there's a lot of room for some really creative uh, explorations, and um, I think their work is so compelling. Um, what I have up here now is a much more commercial enterprise. It's by um, Anthony Zyper. He's the creator of CSI. And over the last couple of years, he's developed a digi-novel um, uh, enterprise where he pitched a book to a publisher that would also include a bunch of video. So as you read through the book, either an e-book or a, a print book, you'll get a code that you can insert here in order to unlock what he calls the cyber bridge. And in the first book, I think it was a portion of the story that he needed in order to understand the rest of the novel. So you would to toggle back and forth between this video and, uh, and the novel. For the second round, for the second book that came out in 2010, he made a full film, like a 100 minute film, broke it up into five minute chunks, and it was a, it was a back storyline, it was a subplot. And it revealed all of this stuff about the main character in the book that you wouldn't otherwise know, and it, should, it shed all this new light on him. So he felt that was a better way, it gave people more freedom to toggle back and forth. They could watch the whole film once, or watch four chunks of it, or just two, and they could read the novel linearly if they liked. It's been tremendously successful for him. I think he's going to continue in this enterprise. And it's not just the video and the novel. It's this whole discussion board thing, and access to him, and Q&A. And you can develop a profile. You can be part of this project. So we want to make it as interactive and inclusive as possible. And because he's created CSI, he managed to get the nasty, scary, clown freak serial killer in the second novel into the CSI shop as one of the baddies, right? And this is exactly what the entertainment industry is looking for. They're looking for ways to cross platforms. They are a vertically integrated industry, and they want to borrow characters and ideas that have already been popularized in the media and bring it into their media. They think they're bringing in those audiences, and they're right. They're bringing in the audience for this book to watch an episode of CSI, and then they're not there watching an episode of CSI anymore. It's so, you know, 1999. Um, so, uh, I. I just ask you to think about the possibilities of how it is that you can create an enterprise that really does cross all of these boundaries. Of course, he's in a golden position because he's the creator of CSI, but the idea is still a good one. This one I think I'll just play in the background as, um, let's see if I can read it. Twitter is as a tool um, to sort of capture the human voice. 
Um, there are lots of documentary multimedia projects out there. I'm, I won't give you a list of them, but there are many projects that include a documentary film, but a whole multimedia enterprise around it that allows people to actually pursue the sort of social action that they're depicting in the documentary, or to do something about the problem that's being profiled in the documentary. So quite often, when you add interactive technology to any sort of non-fiction or fictional storytelling, you give people an opportunity to get something done, to do something. It could be to dress up like an idiot and show up in a flash mob, but it could also be to donate your time to, uh, to a crisis center or something. So, so that's one way in which I think you'll see a lot of uh, transmedia work taking place. I want to make sure we have enough time for discussion. So I will zip through here a little bit. Um, I did want to talk a little bit more about Twitter because it's been, it's proven to be a pretty effective launch pad for some people getting into the television industry. Um, as you know, shit my dad says is on TV. <laughs> Unbelievable. Just won the People's Choice Award for Best Sitcom. It gets about 11 million people a week watching it. Um, it is actually more successful than you might think it would be. The, uh, CBS has optioned three more shows based on Twitter feeds. They like it that a, a character, a voice gets honed and, and created and a following is developed around it. For them, that's enough to think about it as a television property. Um, and I, I also found out recently that The Village Voice said that the Music Critic of the Year for 2010 was an anonymous tweeter named Discographies. Nobody knows, well, I don't know who this guy is, um, <laughs> or who she is. And what this person does is comes up with these 140 character phrases that sort of sum up an album or a band. <laughs> and this was just one example of uh, one of those reviews, quote unquote. <laughs> so I love Twitter for all kinds of reasons, for the way it captures the human voice, but also it's our new version of the sonnet, right? It's this incredibly tight little box that you have to jam a good idea in. And it's so interesting that this person has managed to do it in such a way that now he or she is being acknowledged as the music critic of the year. Um, very interesting. Um, blogs, of course, have morphed into book deals. Um, and I think a lot of people who are writers, that's the first sort of new media platform that they gravitate towards. They think, well, I can sort of do what I do offline in a blog. Um, and I think it's a great idea. It's definitely a platform to explore. But it's, it's one among many. And there's a way to use it very strategically. And I would direct you to a really great, uh, explore here. Yeah. a really great issue of Written By, which is the Journal of the Writers Guild of America. I'll come up this light so that you can see it a little bit better. The whole thing is online. It's called Written By. It's the October, November 2009 issue, which was devoted to how writers could exploit the media. And it included a profile of this gal who um, had put together a TV show. She was going to pitch a TV show. It was sort of a, an off-color Spanglish soap opera. And she realized there was no way in hell this is going to be on TV. And so she talked with her friends who'd done some webisodes, and she made it a web series. And she was the first person who was actually able to join the WGA based on writing webisodes. Um, so there's this whole new uh, uh, possibility, actually, of developing your shows on the sly and putting together these projects that eventually um, end up uh, getting the attention of the, you know, of the guilds and, and of the media industry. That's not necessarily the case that you have to get it on TV in order to make money. This, uh, issue of written by really offered a lot of articles with helpful information about how it is that you could go about making a money-making venture online by doing webisodes and developing blogs and Twitter feeds. And uh, it was a fascinating sort of uh, example of just how far we've come. And we don't even know it. It's from 2009. And I think we still feel that there's no way that writers can really create TV shows and survive online. But there are actually a lot of different services out there that can help you. And um, the, the, this uh, issue, I thought, was absolutely incredible in terms of telling you uh, what's available out there. Um, 
Oh, one of the shows that they profiled was called The Guild, which is a Sophie, an online Sophie. It's basically for gamers. And uh, at first they just made it for themselves and made it for pleasure. And then they started getting a lot of calls from advertisers who were hungry to place their ads in a place where a lot of gamers were going. Then Microsoft heard about the soap opera and they said, you know what? We would like to actually run it on the Xbox. So they provided translation for it in nine different languages so that it could be syndicated through the Xbox platform. I mean, did you even know that television series were actually being syndicated through Xbox? I thought it was a, a, a great reminder that all of those platforms out there that you think are off limits to you as a writer are actually not off limits to you at all. It's a whole new world. Um, the conference that I mentioned to you, the information is here. I don't, it must be on the USC site as well. This is actually on um, the convergenceculture.org page, which comes out of MIT. There's a lot of really great information there about transmedia storytelling. That's, that's why I was there. And this is Henry Jenkins' conference. It's going to be at UCLA. It is April 8th. And I really encourage you to go. The focus is on visual culture and design, but I think that might be really helpful to you to sort of hear what these people have to say about what they need in, in terms of storytelling. Um, and uh, some of the topics that they mentioned that they're going to talk about are explicitly topics that would apply to, uh, to writers of transmedia properties. I wanted to finish up my comments here with the sort of laundry list of things that I might suggest to somebody who uh, might want to try to go into the media and then we'll have time to, oh my god, I said it in my thought, sorry. I will be very quick. You're just going to feel late. Really? No, 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 no. Don't feel late at all. That. No, no, and I, I, yeah, no, tell us the list. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing, the most important thing, is start playing with it. Get a Twitter account. <laughs> Practice with a blog. Get a Facebook page, see what people are talking about. Um, I know so many writers who are really reluctant to throw themselves online because they think it's just a waste of their time. But I think you really need to become familiar with this media in order to see whether it might fit with your creative projects. I'd also suggest that you participate in an online community in a really immersive way. Figure out something that you're interested in. It could be related to your work, it could be related to something that is just a hobby of yours. And just immerse yourself in it on, in, online. Figure out how these communities work, what people want, what they're trying to get from it, what they're not getting from it. Is there something that you could offer through your work uh, that people are hungry for? Talk with technologists. You are on a campus that is filled with technologists, with people you know, who are filmmakers, engineers, game designers, website builders. They want to work with you. They're going to have to work with you to get anything made. Talk with them. Figure out what's coming up, what the new media really looks like, and see if it sparks some interesting ideas in your work. Then imagine how you might take your idea, whether it's a play or a novel or a screenplay or a poem, how you could turn that into a world, right, that can sustain multiple storylines and characters. That's the best sort of transmedia enterprise. That's the er transmedia enterprise. It's like Star Wars, right? It's big enough to accommodate all kinds of interactions and all kinds of storylines and subplots. What might yours be? Think of it as an exercise. Imagine how you might design a character that could play well across different media platforms. How would it mutate to operate as a Twitter feed? And what would it look like if it were a blogger? What would it look like as an animated character? How would that change its traits? This is an interesting way to think about the work that you're already doing. And if your story is fictional, think about how it might interface in a meaningful way with the real world. Because that's one thing that happens when you <coughs> embed interactive technology into a story. You're basically embedding the real world in your story. You're making it possible for real people to have real interactions in real time with your stuff. <laughs> you're inviting them to do something. And maybe it's just a thumbs up or it's a comment, but it could be much more than that. So imagine what those roles might be and the agency that you might be able to grant to people who are interacting with your work. Um, I'll stop there because I want to make sure we have enough time to chat.
great because um, I didn't say before we started that for those of you who are not familiar with the MPW, and I think most people here are, um, it is a multidisciplinary sort of a program. We are uh, fiction writers, nonfiction writers, poets, screenwriters, playwrights. Um, people are, are learning to write about place and science and um, what I'm interested in, I, I think there are probably lots of questions. I wanted you to know about Johanna that she has her PhD, um, did her dissertation, oh. yes, on, on, on I, I, I had heard her say that she'd done it on betweenness. In fact, the, the title of the, the, the paper, the, the, the thesis was Between Figures. So this is something that's um, the sort of the nature of things hybrid has drawn you from the beginning, no? Oh, yes. Um, so, I do, I think because there's not a lot of time, I want to open it up to you guys, but um, I just, I, I wondered if you would maybe talk for a second about um, whether or not you were, how you, how you, tell us a little bit about your history in terms of getting into this world, because you thought you were going to be an academic, for starters, yes? Yes. And, um, and a little bit about, uh, you know, you're talking about Twitter and about how you think it's such a uh, sort of, accommodates voice or, or, or inspires voice, and I just would love you to talk to us a little bit about this line that we're walking between art and entertainment, and or is there a line between art and entertainment? And, um, oh, that's like four of each question. No, 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 it's not, but just, just give us a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and then, then we'll open it up. Okay. okay. I'm trying to be as brief as possible. Okay. Um, when I was getting my PhD in English, I was writing about um, modernist avant-garde writers, one of my uh, direct, one of my uh, dissertation committee members was a week, and he had really gotten into the web. This was in 1994, and uh, so he gave us a tour of the Louvre, right, using the Mosaic browser. Uh, browser, and I was just in tears. I just couldn't believe it. I thought this would have changed my life if I had had access to this technology when I was a kid. And I realized that this was really the future of literacy, that this was the future of libraries and knowledge acquisition, and what the hell was I doing in an English department? And so that's when I started weaning my way out of the trajectory towards English professor. And I went to work at a web startup, and then I worked at a multimedia gaming company, because I really thought that there was no way I was going to understand literature, signification, and representation unless I understood multimedia. And I still believe that is absolutely the case. It's just taking some time for these genres to sort of uh, emerge and, and, and attract the broadest possible audiences. But I'm not surprised about how the internet has become absolutely uh, uh, folded into every aspect of our lives. Imagine our lives today without it. It'd just be completely different. So um, that's sort of that story. Um, but I'd love to hear from you guys. Questions, comments, observations, uh, anything. Questions, you guys. There's Gina over here. Okay. Always. <laughs> Always. So the C C S I created as Anthony Zucker, you said? Zyker. Zyker. Um, do you have any idea how many people actually read the book as opposed to watch the movie? <laughs> um, I know it was an international bestseller, yeah. but I don't know how many read the book. <laughs> I can't tell you that. But I think it's been a very successful venture for him. If people didn't read the book, they wouldn't understand the movie. Especially the first time around, the movie was only only made sense if you were reading the book. And there are many, many uh, children's book series that are structured exactly this way. He basically stole an idea from Scholastic. They've done a big series called 39 Steps, which has been um, huge success for them. It's for reading reluctant learners so that you force them to read like 10 pages of a book and then they get to watch a 10 minute video. And then the video only makes sense if you read those pages. And then you have to read some more from the book before you can watch the next video. Teachers love it. It works so well with kids who uh, just felt that books were not for them. So it's sort of this carrot that they're using in order to pull people through it. Um, so I think he found it was a very successful format. It was the only way you could know the story is if you did both. Yeah. And even with the second book, the second Digi novel, the film was only a subplot, a backstory. So if, you, if you've read The Watchmen, the graphic novel, there's a character in, has anybody read The Watchmen? 
It's so smart, yeah. Um, there's a character in the graphic novel who's reading a comic book that is about, um, that is sort of a parable about the story that's going on in the main story. And I think that's how this uh, film is functioning in his second Digi novel. Sure. Sure. Yes. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you guys are forcing writers to become more creative and help tell a story. But at the same time, is there a danger that in doing so, while you're creating a lazy audience, uh, you no know, longer sort of rely on the restrictions in their imagination? We're now kind of telling them, not just describing to them, but we're showing them what we're describing. I think that it's usually more complicated than that. Most of the new media stuff that I've taken a look at, I don't find it any easier to understand than I do a novel. Um, I don't think that it makes my synapse inspire less because there's an animation that I've looked at as well. And I think a lot of these try to combine a, a literary experience where you're literally reading paragraphs at a time and the visual stuff. I just showed you the visual stuff because that's what you show on the screen, right? I don't show the pages of the actual book. But I think that's the challenge, is to figure out what the balance is. And I think the new media formats are just there to sort of stimulate your imagination in ways that the stimulation was simply not there before. You did not have those forms to rip off of or to invoke in your storytelling. And so I see it as more of a pleasure and a challenge for the writer um, than uh, a burden. And I think the final result, it doesn't necessarily dumb anything down. I think when you add multimedia to something, sometimes it makes it far more complex. Um, so I guess that's, that's my general uh, response. Does anybody else feel that way, that somehow this is just dumbing down literary culture if you add any audio or visual? Yeah. I actually think it stimulates, because when you talk about um, text and then going off on a tangent and, you know, wikileaks and stuff like that, it just kind of brings the whole world open and it just gives you all these different ways to, like, satisfy your curiosity on any given subject. So, I think it just puts it in a situation where it's like a never-ending story. So, I think that's, that's part of the problem that writers see, is, you know, how do you create ends, right. you know, and, and how do you, uh, how do you curtail uh, uh, trajectory? Um, stopping things from happening is almost more complicated than, than letting them happen. And I, I know that that is one of the topics that, that they're going to discuss at, at Henry Jenkins' um, Transmedia Summit. They talked about it in the first one. Sort of the seeding of control, the lack of control that you have over the potential trajectories, especially with anything that has an interactive component to it. So I think the main problem in jumping, leaping into this area, especially if you're really adding interactive possibilities for people to contribute to the tale and add to it, is that things get too complicated and too messy. And, uh, and sometimes that's not at all what people are looking for in their uh, storytelling experience.
he or she might claim that, oh, this is my intellectual property. But I think that's the goal of a lot of tweeters, is to actually come up with something that would qualify for copyright protection as a tweet. It is really, really hard to do. But that's constantly going to be an issue with any form of integration of social media and user-generated content into your story worlds. Um, that's, a, that's one reason that a lot of big studios really held back from using social media early on, even with their big blockbuster um, um, campaigns and their big blockbuster franchises, because they were worried about the intellectual property issues of making money off of advertising that's accompanying user-generated content. So that's going to be an issue as long as our copyright laws are out of sync with our technology, and right now they're very out of sync with our technology. Um, but it's something we have to just keep fighting that fight. And I think generally the tweets are pretty okay. <laughs> how many of you have tweet? How many of you are tweeters? I'm yeah, I meant to ask. How many are active tweeters? Okay, not bad. Right. Yes. Yeah, but what do you guys tweet about? I'm sorry. <laughs> and does anybody want to tweet? She obviously doesn't tweet. <laughs>
and, uh, and probably unconstitutional, but it's up to the Congress to actually make those decisions, and they're making very bad decisions these days. So I, I think in the next five to ten years, we're still going to have a mess on our hands. I'd be delighted to see it otherwise. Yes? I have two questions, but the big one is you talk about uh, how it's a collaborative process, um, and it, it, it can't be that you like that. I mean, do you see it as becoming something where people um, start learning how to do everything, like people start learning how to be coders and writers and artists and graphic designers, or I mean, do you, do you think it's going to stay this collaborative process? I mean, especially with like, you know, the new education that's, you know, like if it's being taught in schools or classes. And then my other second question is because I know that I took David's class, and I know where he stands. I mean, what do you think about the print book? I mean, do you think it's just out? I mean, should, I mean or, or is it going to be something that stays into? All right, well, those are great questions. Um, and then so to the second question, no, I don't think the print book is, is going away. I think I think we have a strong connection to it. A lot of people are still willing to buy it, and a lot of people are going to still be willing to make it. But I think they'll have a different sort of position in our economy, and they'll have a different sort of aura as an object in a home. You know, um, it'll be uh, like an heirloom. You know, it's something whose materiality is important. Um, you won't just buy an ugly book in order to get what's in it. You'll buy a book that's actually made well because it feels good and it looks good on your coffee table. Um, so I don't think that's going away. And, and print is so much higher resolution than any screen that, that you guys typically see or that I typically see. It's much more pleasing to the eye and you put a tremendous amount of information in there. And it's a very stable medium, unlike digital. Um, DVDs die after a few years, servers die after a few years, it's got to test. They're very unstable uh, as a medium, and so I think print's going to be around for a long time still. It's just going to have a different sort of aura, and it won't be the go-to place for publishing with magazines and newspapers and books. That's just, that's just not going to be the economic model. The other question was about collaboration and whether it's going to become the case that we're going to be able to train ourselves to do everything we need to do in order to create a transmedia story. I think what we're going to find is what we've seen with websites, for instance. It's so easy for us to blog now. You know, hey, uh, it's so easy for us to blog now because there are all these cut and paste platforms out there like WordPress where you don't need to know how to do HTML code at all to put together a pretty good looking web page. So, there's going to be a lot of drag and drop applications that are going to make it a lot easier for us to do cool things that visual people know how to do and we don't know how to do. Um, and even coding, I think, is going to get easier and easier. There's going to be more and more uh, user-friendly methods of creating code. Um, but when it comes to a major, full-scale, professionally developed transmedia property, you're going to have experts. You're going to have people at the top of their field who are specially trained in specific forms of animation and specific forms of game level design and 3D formation. That stuff, I can't even imagine what that world's going to be like when we can all master those art forms at all levels. It just seems impossible to me. And that's kind of a good thing, you know? We, we want specialists. We want people who know their niche. And we want people to work together. Um, I think that's one of the more exciting aspects of this, I think partly because, as I was telling Dinah, one thing I hated about writing my dissertation was being alone all the time. I became a total cat lady, sitting at home, <laughs> writing my dissertation. And as I'm a fellowship, I didn't have to teach anymore or take classes. I went crazy. It was such a horrible solo experience. It was one reason I chose not to be an author. And now, I think it's going to be possible for people to both be authors and be social animals and to work with people. And you have the option of doing something else as well. But this is a, this is a whole new possibility, um, uh, uh, I think, for, uh, for the career of an author. And actually, from the beginning, think about yourself as part of the team. Yeah. Um, John, yeah. talk about um, dialogue. You said that you told me last week that you felt that dialogue was sort of the people that knew how to do dialogue were going to be the people that were really going to be able to make great strides more quickly than other people, and I'm, and I'm interested in that. You know, I don't know if it's true. It was, <laughs> you know, it was just one of these gut instincts. I thought, what sort of skill set could people in a professional writing program 
try to really focus on in order to make sure that they would be really well prepared to be part of the transmedia storytelling team. And the first thing that came to my mind was dialogue. You've got to be good at dialogue. Why do I think that? I think it's, it's about voices, right? And once you take the voice from the page and it becomes an animated figure, it becomes a character of some kind, I think you do need to have some sort of skill set to, to make that transition. I don't think that everybody has to become a skilled screenwriter. It's not that you have to all become professional scriptwriters in order to participate in this. But my, my instinct is that the development of, of voice is going to be crucial to, and to most new media enterprises, certainly not all of them. But it's really just a bit mm -hmm. I have no basis for this. <laughs> None at all. Other questions, you guys? Oh, there's one more. Other questions about um, less about writing, more about what happens once someone creates something like this in terms of monetization. Yeah. We, these are amazing things that you showed us, but outside of the normal television show that we read and things like that that are already inherently monetized, yeah. how people handle that? Well, it was interesting. I was really surprised at how many services were available that were described in this uh, written by. Uh, Issue. Um, it, I think the key is, say for instance, you're developing a series of websites, right? and uh, and you're looking to monetize that. And the key thing, actually, if you're thinking about using any advertising money, which is usually the way that people monetize that, model, that that is the main model, um, is that you need to create a sort of online enterprise that is really sticky, but attracts a particular kind of audience, an audience that is understandable, legible to an advertiser. So one reason that the Guild did so well is because it specifically attracted gamers. Right? It was speaking in their dialect, it was doing a funny soap opera about their crazy lives and just the fact that they're wasting their lives playing these stupid games, right? They want to make fun of themselves, they, they want the inside story, right? The joke's on them, so it's their joke. Advertisers love it because they're looking for a way to reach specific audiences, and that's the beauty of websites, right? And web content is that you can attract niche audiences. ABC, NBC, CBS, they can't do that. The audiences are too broad and fragmented. But, so create a niche audience, and say you're developing a series of webisodes. You can never just do that. People who watch webisodes expect to have discussion boards. They expect to be able to bitch and moan and groan and, and celebrate you know, everything that's happening in the show. They want to contribute storylines. They want to be a part of it. So you have to open it up, right? That's even more opportunity for engagement and for advertising. During your webisodes themselves, of course, you can run ads in the video, but you can also have ads that are running on your site. And not just on that site, but on the blog about your webisodes and when they're coming out. You need to create this sort of universe of multimedia content that is very sticky and that attracts a legible audience for advertisers. And it really ends up sort of strengthening the final product as well. The Twitter feed is from the perspective of a minor character who's really bizarre and strange and never has any lines in the show, but has a Twitter feed. That's a way of pulling in an entirely different audience to come and see your shows. They have about appointment viewing, right? Always having a schedule or posting your website so that there's a moment when people come, right, to your site. That's what advertisers are looking for. They're looking for appointments. And um, the perfect storm, really, in order to create the best sort of monetization is to have a live event, have some buy-in from old media, and to have to use new media in some strategic way. That's the way to really create the, the perfect storm for advertisers and for engagement. And that's what Marika did. Thanks. Yeah. So how do you think Charlie Sheen's doing at Transmedia Story Oh my god. <laughs> he broke a record, right, for getting one million additional followers within a week. Nobody's done it that quickly. Oh. So what does that say about the integrity of, of uh, I mean, you know, if, if, if that's, I mean, I would love you to talk a little bit about your own feelings about the sort of this fine line between um, art and entertainment and the audience that new media is actually attracting. You know, that's nice for Charlie Sheen, but I, I, it makes me want to run the other way. Oh, I think it, it makes most people want to run the other way. Well, we're not, we're not following him. How, how, yeah. yeah. how do we? How well, do people we like to witness a train wreck. You know, and but how are we discerning in this new media? How, with, with the bombardment of information.
information and uh, and material, how can we be discerning? How are we to how are we to know? Well, I think you follow your taste, you follow your nose. But the Charlie Sheen thing is is a is a is a particular sort of perfect storm, right? Because you have news events, you have real world events that are happening with him outside the show. You have a show that is partially based on his actual personality and who he is as a real person. Then you have the real person who is a complete creep and really scary and really entertaining in a freaky way. And that is exactly what advertisers want. That's what media outlets want. And Twitter turns out to be a great place for a ranting, raving lunatic. <laughs> and it's safe for us to tune into that Twitter feed and to make fun of them. I don't think most people are tuning in and thinking, wow, oh, what a stand-up guy, man. He, he's really got it right, you know? The majority of people are laughing at him. And, uh, you know, that's the way we function. So I think the Charlie Sheen thing is, is, uh, is a very unique sort of example of the way in which art and representation, social media, old media, and real life end up converging and creating this just huge media storm. You know, you cannot avoid Charlie Sheen now. <laughs> he is everywhere. He is looking at me from every magazine cover. I can't get away from him. Come pass. Oh, I, I have to say something. Yes, That's please like do. In my gut, just bothers me about that whole conversation. Um, I just went to a panel on um, the anti-death penalty, and um, prisoners don't have internet, and I think that says a lot about our society. And I don't think we so much need to look at Charlie Sheen, but I think we need to look at ourselves as a society and how making fun of somebody who. I actually have a lot of compassion for the entire situation with everybody he's with. Um, I have a lot of compassion for prostitutes. I think but do you have compassion for him? A societal, I have compassion for him. Mm -hmm. I did think, you find it in yourself, or was it just immediately you had compassion for him? I think as a human being, that the higher potential of ourselves is to find compassion in everyone because everybody's sure, complex. Sure. But was it a struggle? I guess. No. <laughs> like, really, like I really think that he was fast. I do think he's fascinating. I like certainly don't come from him at a place of judgment. Like my grandmother was talking about like the Charlie Sheen show. And like she has no idea about everything perhaps going on around him, but she too she loves the show. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, Greta, what are you talking about? The culture of humiliation? Is that what you're asking yes. about? You're asking about and the culture. And I think that And so that South prisoners don't have internet is about the culture of humiliation? No. No, the idea that we are that in some way new media, old media, this is a culture that thrives at this point. Um, or, or enjoys, you know, whether it's you know Jersey Housewives or, or Jersey whatever, or or Charlie Sheen, that we thrive on on, on the humiliation of others. I think and that's always been the case. I think so too. I think it's think always been the case. But, and, and the media is an outlet where this this aspect of human behavior is is you know on display once again. Um, I don't think that it's made it any more or less possible for us to indulge in these kinds of fantasies and, and this kind of behavior. I think it's it's quite consistent. And, yeah. and my only is new media is a way of telling a story. So there's been print books that have done the same thing that a Charlie Sheen thing would do. So it's not it's not the idea of whether new media is bad and print is good, it's the idea of how you tell the story in a different way. You can tell the same story about Charlie Sheen in a book. No, it's just in terms of how many people you're reaching. Really, it's well, okay, but I'm just saying that I, I guess I'm looking at it more as when you're talking about it, it's more how can you take something you're passionate about and you're writing about whether it's fiction or not fiction and find different ways to tell it. And I just think probably she doesn't have to be an option for that. It has it, right. it, to do with the thing, is what I'm saying. Right. So it's a different kind of story. And actually, I'd say that we have far less opportunities for a concentration of the media story like that now than we used to when there were just three big networks and those were our main gatekeepers and that's how we saw the audio-visual story of our age. The people at those networks decided what we saw. Mm -hmm. And now that's not the case. And those audiences were huge, huge. No shows on television get anything like the ratings that any of the shows did in the 1970s. It's not a single one. Not even the same ballpark. So in that respect, the gatekeeper has, uh, has really uh, uh, much less power than they used to, uh, now than they used to have. 
There's so many more options for avoiding the Charlie Sheen stuff that one decides we care about. And I think Twitter, in general, certainly the feeds that I follow are all very positive, pro-human spirit, excited. I've done a couple TED Talks, and so I've been very exposed on Twitter to strangers who send comments to me. It's a much friendlier sort of atmosphere than YouTube, where I have 10,000 comments and most of them are negative. <laughs> Twitter, I have found actually a place that is much, much more positive uh, sort of location for people to connect with one another. I don't know if that's just my experience, but compared to what I've seen even on the TED site, on Slashdot, on YouTube, it's, it's a much more, um, um, it's a place where people are hoping to connect with strangers. I have a question about the Anthem Deadline program. Yeah. Um, so, I, I'm not a student, I have been into it. Um, Let's say that I enter the program and want to kind of create this universe of multimedia content, like, you know, create a world, this world is a writing project. Is that something that I could do, or would it be more like write a book and then turn it into? Within the MPW program. Well, first of all, I should introduce MPW faculty since you asked. Right behind you is Principal Mobius and MG Lord. Rita Williams is over here. Who else? Who else? Is there any more other faculty? Gina, Gina and, we, and you guys were introduced to Gina earlier. Um, Gina and I. So the answer to that is that um, at the MPW, you can take a, a, an array of writing classes. You can focus in fiction, nonfiction, writing for um, stage and, and screen, po poetry. Any other foci? Are those who are foci? Yeah. Oh, are and, and Cell phone story. You, you provide, and we do, and we are introducing now a new media component. So people are writing, um, taking new classes um, that are focusing on new media. Uh, and, and the answer is um, that you will carve out the sort of, um, you know, program that you want. You'll focus on, in one area. Can your thesis at this point be a new media project? I don't know that we are prepared at this point to have somebody shepherd somebody through a new media project. I mean, your, your thesis, your final project would probably be um, a collection of poems or stories, a novel, a collection of essays, a memoir, a screenplay, or a stage play. So in that novel. sense. Did I not say, or a graphic novel. Um, but, but so are we prepared to help you at this point create a, a new world um, using new media? I think probably not yet. But we're prepared to help you investigate the possibilities in a course. Did I answer that properly? Thank you. Um, and you can talk to any of us more about that. We're all available to you. Okay. Um, other questions? Oh, way in the back. Yes. I'm curious how you attracted people to your Twitter site. And if I can use a case study, uh, a friend of mine recently published his first novel. He was fairly established. Um, in other fields where he had a following through, through some nonfiction writing he had done. As is the case with all first novels, he got zero support from his publisher, who then encouraged him to get on Facebook, start a Twitter, start a blog. Um, he even had a blog on uh, the Huffington Post. We sat down afterwards to analyze all this, and I tried to, I asked him, now, how much going into all the new media, how many other books do you think you sold because of this? Um, he could not come up with a single example. And so my question again is, how do you attract the people to these new media? Yeah, it's, it's very tricky. Um, and when I first started studying social media, I turned to a friend of mine uh, who was working on another project for Marlon Lear uh, that was very much a social media-based campaign trying to um, uh, build an audience around an online viral video. And I asked her, how do you do it? How do you get people to follow you? How do you get people to share the video and send it around? And it was through sheer force of personality. She would go out and she would do research to figure out who might be interested in the content that she was trying to uh, get out there. She'd contact them, write them a nice letter. She'd follow them on Twitter, send them a nice note. She tried to explain who she was, what her project was. It was all about old school PR. 
And it was her being herself saying this is the project that she's working on. And uh, she was incredibly good at it. Now she's working at this huge firm in New York that does precisely this. It's called Purpose. They build social media campaigns around all kinds of progressive causes. So they work on the Lance Armstrong thing and I don't know what else. But I was surprised at how, uh, how much it was based on written missives from her and her voice to other people. And she would scan through Twitter, for instance. I mean, she had to go through all the social media platforms. But on Twitter, she would go around looking for people who would be interested in, in the topic of this video. She would follow them. She would retweet what they were saying. She would comment on what they were saying. She would send them direct messages. Then they would start following her. Then they would start retweeting her stuff. Then they would start commenting on her comments. It's a, it's a very social system. And uh, if you have the luxury of having some sort of relationship with a larger broadcast outlet, either online or offline, HuffPub, that's one reason that, that you know, writers who get paid to write end up writing for free on a website like that, because they know they can tap into a larger readership than would ever come to their own personal blog. That's one way to sort of drive traffic back, is to get your voice on platforms and reach new audiences that uh, you never would be able to reach. And so uh, that's what happened with the, with the TED Talks when I started when I first got a talk that I'd done here at USC posted on TED.com, that's when my Twitter feed just became overwhelming. All these people started reaching out to me and following me and asking me questions and wanting me to follow them and just look at their projects. And it was an incredibly social process. And I had a lot of meetings, physical in-person meetings, coffee meetings with people that I met over Twitter. Um, and uh, it was, it was just another way of meeting people. So I think the odd thing about new media is that all of the old sort of strategies that you would have used in old media, and, and in a time even before media ever existed, which is just making contacts with people, trying to figure out how to figure out what I have might be of interest to you and what you have might be of interest to me, building that conversation is absolutely the skill set that the, the most successful people on social media have used. Okay, last question up there, I think, and then I'm going to release you because oh. I feel that I release them. <laughs> Go ahead. I was just curious about something on your bio because it says you were a digital archivist at Vivendi. Yeah. And given that you said that paper is a bit more stable, I'm trying. I'm wondering how you went about archiving. Uh, you know, what did you look for in that? That was. It was. It was really a dark time when I started. I had worked in libraries for six years before I took this job as a digital archivist at, within the Universal Games. So that's why the irony is crazy. But um, I had to go through their research and development facility and figure out what sorts of um, digital uh, assets we could archive and reuse in the future. And they were developing animations and characters, and, and there were photographs, and there was illustrations and artwork, and they had franchises. and so. They wanted to be able to reuse a lot of the work from previous titles and new titles, but they needed a system for being able to find this stuff and tag it and figure out what was copyright protected and what wasn't. And I started attending a lot of conferences on digital archiving, and I attended one here at USC that was excellent. Um, and it was incredibly depressing to find out that all of this digital media was far less stable than print media, even less stable than film. <laughs> film usually lasts about 50 years. A DVD can last two CDs. Check some of the old CDs you haven't played in a while and see if they still play. Think about the lifespan of your each one of your hard drives that you've ever used on your computer. So it's it's very daunting, actually, and kind of scary that there's this feeling that once you've digitized something, you've saved it forever. But that is actually not the case at all. And so a lot of libraries are still very protective of all of their print copies and print work because that's the most stable sort of place to store this material. Um, it's a big problem for the digital archives. The Showa archive here at USC has 56,000 testimony videos. And this is the kind of thing you can't just do. <coughs> oh, sorry, your grandma, well, we lost it, you know. It was an unstable medium. They have to find a way to permanently save this stuff. And as far as I know, there is absolutely no permanent solution to archiving digital media. Nothing. So you didn't really settle on anything in particular? Uh, I didn't what? You didn't really settle on anything in particular in the... 
oh, well, we just use databases that were available, and we had tape backups for, you know, um, and, but we knew that all of those things were ultimately unstable, and we did not have a perfect solution, no, not even close to it. Thank God for tape backups. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Tonight. Thank you.